hitting all the stores and find them. Okay. Well, welcome to our event. Um, this is the NTIA MBA workshop. And this is a very special one because we are doing it in celebration of the International Women's Day. How many of you know? Well, yeah. Uh, what's the day that we celebrate? March the 8th. Yeah, so we are a little bit earlier, so we have a few, we have a couple more extra days to celebrate, okay? Uh, before I start with the program, um, let me explain to you that I have two parts of the speech. First is that, not so much a speech, I mean just a chat, okay? So don't, don't be too worried about that. Uh, first part is that I'm going to talk about the sponsors, and the second part is that we'll talk about the reasons we're doing the event and all that. So, okay, bear with me, it won't be long, all right. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to mention uh, our dignitaries for tonight who are here. Uh, of course, we have the Dean of the Nadell School of Business, Ms. Carola Smith over there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carola, and welcome. Well, hold on, Ed. this is your place, right? So thanks for having us. <laughs> you see, <laughs> I wear both hats. I'm the chair, or I'm Anna Kwong, I'm the chair of the uh, Antiox MBA program, but I'm also the visiting instructor of Santa Barbara City College. So actually, this is my place too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see, and of course we have our exceptional panelists tonight, okay? Um, we will give a more detailed introduction, but I'm going to go through very quickly, okay, and mention to them. Um, Megan A, you want to wave it? <laughs> if anyone like wine tasting, that's a person to talk to, okay. We have Kathy O'Dell, <laughs> that we gives out loans, so remember her, okay. Uh, digital marketing, Michelle Geisen. <laughs> you love sports, of course we have Tracy here. <laughs> and the moderator is Lisa, and in a moment I will have a short fire. Okay? So before we start, I would like to mention a little bit about our sponsors, okay? First, of course, is Santa Barbara City College. I have, uh, most of you are from City College, and then some of you are from NTX, so I'm gonna talk about both of the sponsors. Santa Barbara City College is located here. You can see it's gorgeous, okay? Uh, this is a place I've worked uh, for I don't know how many years. It's a long, long time, okay? Um, it actually, from year 2013 and year 2015, it was actually named as the number one community college in the entire nation by the Aspen Institution. It's very prestigious honor. And ever since then, they have actually been awarded many, many recognition, uh, including one of the most beautiful campus in the nation, as you can tell. Uh, anyone of you have a chance to walk around? I mean, but I think many of my MBA students are actually alumni from the SP. How many of you are alumni from here? Ah, there you go, you see. Well, actually one, oh, Linda as well, okay. So we have uh, actually have a one big family. All right, so then I'm going to move around and talk about Antioch because most of my city college students uh, don't know what's Antioch and then what, why are we doing here, okay? You can see that Antioch, the, the MBA program is that we aim to build a strong and united community of strategic leaders for social business and nonprofit organization. Now you may wonder, this is not a typical MBA, what's, what's going on here? And if I give you the history of Antioch, then you'll know why. Now this is a building, how many of you have been to Antioch? How many have been to Antioch? It's actually down the street, only two miles away from here. Okay, this is the building now. That was our building. That was in, the, the school was founded in 1852. So it's about 168 years. I don't mean that we are 168 years, it's a school that is 160 years, so. It started in Ohio, and it's actually one of the institution that accept, the first institution that accept black students. And if you look at the years, you mean that we are very, pro we very, very progressive. And we're also the first school that actually hire female faculty. So that is Antioch. 
obviously, uh, we weren't that very popular in Ohio because you know that's plantation, we were causing trouble. But fast forward is that, oh no, we're not fasting forward yet, here. Look, these are the alumni. <laughs> you recognize them? <laughs> Probably not, right? That's the first graduate class in 1855. Isn't it, it, it fun to have alumni looking there? They look quite different, right? <laughs> The founder of uh, Antioch University is actually Horace Mann. Uh, he is uh, one of the most outstanding and influential um, educators in the United States of America. Uh, he was actually the one who designed the public system for this country together with Thomas Jefferson. I'm sure all of you have heard of Thomas Jefferson, but Horace Mann was also another very influential person in those days. He was the one who suggested that um, we should promote public education because education or free or affordable education must be allowed in order to promote democracy and equality. And another of his very famous quote is, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. So that motto is the one that ties in all the program of the Antioch University. And this explains the why our MBA students are not only just thinking about being successful, but they're also thinking about giving back to the society and having a sense of purpose to solve problems. This is the MBA program. We teach creativity and innovation, and the key point is that we emphasize Antioch is doing, the Antiochian is doing well by doing good. So each of the capstone projects has to solve one social problem that they believe that is important to them. Coming closer to home is that apart from the MBA, for any of the Santa Barbara City College students, if you're interested in transferring, uh, we also have uh, the communication and marketing, business entrepreneurship, and uh, uh, apply technology and business leadership for the uh, BA or BS. But I want to introduce you to our newest addition and it's a BA in management. This BA in management is kind of like a little brother of the MBA. And we would really like to see more Santa Barbara City College can benefit from, the, from there. You can transfer up to 90 credits from Santa Barbara City College. We work with you, customize, to see how fast or how slow you want to move down the program. And also, we are offering scholarship. So any one of you are thinking about transferring, make sure that you talk with us. The program is that, the, like I said, this is a little brother of the MBA, so we also practice the five pillars of success. First is holistic balance of personal and professional development and success. We believe in balance. So it's not just making a lot of money, but you have to be happy, you have to have friends, and enjoy life and have a sense of purpose. Innovative problem solving and cutting edge management and entrepreneurship techniques, if any one of you are thinking about starting a business. Globalization and cross-cultural relationship. How many of you international students here? There you go, oh my goodness, wow, yeah. Yeah, including myself too, yeah. <laughs> High power digital and traditional marketing tactics. How many of you may think that marketing may be your field of, of, uh, of career in the future? Let's see, okay, of course we have a marketing class here. And, and the last one is social business and corporate social responsibility that empower positive changes in the business world and beyond. The world, around is actually becoming more affluent, more wealthy. Um, it used to be we have the wealthy countries and then we have the poor countries. But times goes by, actually the gap is narrowing. So now we, we have a lot of countries kind of like in the middle. We can see that China is, has been growing very fast. India has been growing very fast. Those are all good news. However, despite all the wealth that we have created, we still have a lot of social problems that we need to solve. The world is moving so fast 
that very often that we see younger people or the younger generation or even um, anybody with, a, with an older age, actually we got lost, confused, and not sure about the future. So therefore, Antia emphasized on creating winners. The kind of winners we talk about is not just a winner in your academic studies, not just getting A's, but also a winner in your life, that you have a sense of purpose, you know where you're going, and make your life a meaningful one so that you will be happy. So make your mark, create a beautiful world. That's the key point for all the students. There is a strong sense of urgency for businesses because we need students who want to make a big difference in the real world. So let your light shine. The world needs you. And universities like Antioch is waiting for you because we need students who are passionate about making the world a better place. Okay, so this is all about our, our sponsors. Thank you. Let's see. All right. So now my next part of it is that I'm going to introduce the, our event. We are going to talk about uh, um, successful experience from our panelists. Okay. Let me see. <clears throat> it's funny to actually have two different speeches. I'm supposed to have another person, but anyway, I'm playing two roles. Okay. When I was uh, little, um, I, those of you who know me is that I'm originally from Hong Kong. Okay. Um, I was brought up by a single parent family, and every day when I was a kid, my mom would tell me one thing: Wouldn't it be nice if you were a boy? I'm serious now, this is not make up story. This is really my life. And I would ask mom, why? I mean, ever since I was like four years old, five years old, I'm listening to this every day. Isn't it nice if you were a boy? And I said, why? He said, and she explains to me is that, if you were a boy, you can take care of me when I get old. And I love to travel. No, we, we were not wealthy, okay? So these are all the dreams. I remember that my mom had this calendar from all around the world, from Switzerland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, United States of America. She wants to travel, but she said, if I have a boy, the boy can travel with me. That's not very encouraging, right? I tried to convince her. I said, no, no, it's, it's fine, it's fine. But he, he, she kept saying that a daughter is like, well, this, this, well I, I'm sure your, your mom probably won't tell you that, but my mom told me the story. She said, a daughter is like water that's gone onto the street, so you cannot retrieve them once they got married. So when I get married, I'll be serving my husband's family, so I'll be taking my in-laws to travel around the world. I told my mom and said, Mom, I'll take you to travel. I don't like my in-laws. <laughs> well, that was when I was five years old, okay? My in-laws are not here, okay? Well, to her pleasant surprise, I was the boy who actually did all that. We travel around the world. I take care of her. She's 88 years old now. She's still living about 10 minutes away from me, and I take care of her. But when I ask her, I say, Mom, do you still want a boy? You know what she said? She said, yes, a boy is always better. <laughs> I can't do anything. <laughs> well, fast forward to now, to today, as a woman, it's very different from when I was a, a woman. You guys have a much, much better opportunity. I don't mean that everything is perfect, but this is a good time, even a great time to be a woman. Never before have we seen many, so many women stepping forward and representing us. This year, we have a total of 127 women serving the Congress, 22 of them black, 13 Latina, 8 Asian American, 2 Native American, 1 Middle East, and 1 multiracial. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> we also have 6 Democratic and 3 Republican women serving as governors. 
If we look at the corporate world, we also have seen a dramatic increase in women taking leadership positions. The share of women sitting in the board of Fortune 500 in 1995 was about 9.6 percent. Now is over about a little bit of 20 percent. Uh, it's not good enough, but it's, it, it, it actually has improved a lot. Now the good news is that in year 2018, women on boards is a Senate bill of 826. The number is 826 was signed into laws to advance equitable gender representation on California corporate boards. We're talking about businesses now. California is the first leading state in the nation to require all public health corporations located in California to have at least one female director on their boards by December year 2019. This is a great, this is a great step. And the number of female directors will actually vary if the size of the company are bigger. And all must comply by December 31st, year 2021. Now this kind of representation in both the political and the corporate world is extremely crucial to our quickly advancing society. It is an important stop it is an important step in diversity and inclusion, as well as the advancement of women and the modern society. Because we need to have a voice, a voice about our future and what we want to shape the law and the principles. In the world of business, we need more women to represent us, to participate in defining what the major market players is to make our economy better, society better, the world better, and more opportunities for our future generation, because all women are mothers. Um, most women are mothers. And I'm very proud to announce my students, my cohort six, okay, the MBA, a degree was one dubbed as a men's degree. Well, men takes MBA, women don't, okay? We actually have a female majority, <laughs> right? Of course, we have a few good gentlemen, and thank you for joining us, okay? <laughs> well, in, by the way, in, uh, in the audience, how many of you actually think about that you will eventually be a political or business leader? How many of you want to be there? Oh, good. Come on, here, let me be proud and confident. That's good, all right? Well, the theme of uh, the year 2020 International Women's Day is an equal world, is an enab enabled world. Think about that 50% of the, of, the, of the population in this world are women. So therefore, by enabling them, the whole world will become a better place. So thank you for joining us in this very special day. This is not just an event, as I was sharing with many of my students, I said. This is an annual event. This is basically a, a movement, and we have to keep working to push it forward because what is happening is not enough, and we would like to see more. So tonight, our topic is entrepreneurship through innovation and resilience. With no further ado, I would like to introduce our uh, Moderator. Now, let me say a few words about Lisa. Lisa is the News and Public Affairs Director of KCSB, FM 91.9, located in UCSB. She moved to Santa Barbara five years ago after spending most of her career at Commercial News Talk Radio Station in Los Angeles. She has hosted music radio shows, I think many of you are interested, for a national network airing on over 100 radio stations across the nation. Lisa also has a voice over an audio production business that creates marketing messages and transit agency. Uh, if any one of you take a bus, one of the major bus in Los Angeles, this Lisa's friendly voice that actually greets you. So join me and welcome Lisa. There you go. Okay, so please, can I have the uh, panelists, please? Thank you. Okay, sure. Oh gosh. I think 
gets on, and we're excited to be here tonight. I just wanted to get a quick show of hands before we introduce uh, our panelists. Who's a, stu who's a student here tonight? Who's kind of mostly students and, co and community members? Hi, some community members too. That's great that you guys came out. As Anna, thank you, Anna. As Anna was saying in the introduction, the world is changing so quickly these days. It seems we wake up uh, and there's some something new and interesting going on every single day. So with change comes opportunity, and you as uh, entrepreneurs have the opportunity to uh, innovate and use your creativity uh, through resilience and innovation to make this a better world. And our entrepreneurs on the panel tonight are going to be sharing some stories, um, really inspirational stories um, and motivating stories that could help you in your path along the way. So we're really glad that you're out here tonight. Um, let's go ahead and we're, I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves, take a minute or two to talk about um, their backgrounds, where they came from, how they got to where they are today, and if you also care to share um, maybe one, a way in which you hope to impact the world through, through, through your work and, and through being here, you can um, share that as well. And then we have lots of stories and we'll have plenty of time at the end for you to ask your questions. So be thinking about that as we hear from these panelists. So let's start with uh, Kathy O'Dell from Women's okay. Economic Ventures. Okay. Um, so I am actually a necessity entrepreneur. Um, I became an entrepreneur and went actually in my early 20s because I was on my own. I was putting myself through college, and I found I couldn't get through college because I couldn't um, I couldn't stay employed, make enough money. I had to go back, you know, to go back to school because in the days. This tells you I'm old. Um, back when I was going to school, you couldn't graduate unless you were enrolled full time. So it wasn't like taking classes and building up credits. And so as I was getting very frustrated with being in and out of college, um, one of my friends whose father owned a title company said to me, you know what, you've lived in this town a long time. You know it pretty well. Why don't you get your real estate license and sell real estate? I went. Are you kidding? Mm -hmm. And he says, no, think about it. You can make your own office hours. You can decide what you do. You can go to classes, and then you can come back. It worked. I actually put myself through Stanford by selling real estate. Um, and when I got out, I thought I was going to do something else. But um, I found that a lot of businesses um, weren't eager to hire um, a young woman graduate, even with a Stanford degree. And so the people that were most eager to hire me were small businesses that you know were, were doing something where they needed talent and they didn't want to pay for it, and they were willing to take a woman. Um, so that was how I learned to just jump in and do things. And my first business that I started here in this town, three of us, it started in my garage was because I was a single mother and I needed a job and I didn't want to leave Santa Barbara. That business is now Carl Stortz Imaging. Uh, it is a $500 million business and has 450 employees. I left long ago to do other things, but what I want you to start thinking of tonight is that you can take risks and do things you don't have to have everything planned out for you. And we'll get into more why that's true later. Tracy. Wow. <laughs> I know. And, wow. How do I follow that, right? Tracy Miller is with the Riptide Sports. She started it with her family. Yeah, Brad and I, my husband and I, we started Riptide Sports 10 years ago, January. Uh, it was an idea that our son had for how to make a skateboard work differently. So we manufacture urethane parts uh, that provide the set suspension for skateboards, longboards, e-skate, uh, derby, roller derby, anything that needs to roll, we do a customized suspension. Um, I come from, uh, I graduated from Pepperdine University, uh, started out in software sales, and then partnered with uh, my interior design partner for many years. Uh, when we had the idea for Riptide, um, basically we, we had the idea, had no idea if it would be popular or necessary or a good thing. Uh, so I made a website um, just to put the flag up to see if there was any interest at all. 
there was. Uh, it took us one and a half years to become our own brand. It took us three and a half years to get to the point where my husband could leave his career and we could do the business together full time. Very scary world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, but here we are at year 10, and now our son has joined the business, too, since he's come home from college. So we are truly a family business. It's very fun. Megan and Kunin, Megan no. Kunin Wines. Hi. Uh, I, this is working. So um, my name is Megan and Kunin. I have Kunin Wines. We have a tasting room. We have two tasting rooms in the Funk Zone and a winery uh, just near the airport here. And when I uh, went to school, I mean, I think it's important to follow your passions, but when I went to school, I was studying English literature and cultural theory. I thought I'd end up in some kind of journalism. I worked at the Chicago Sun-Times every summer. Uh, but by the time I graduated, I didn't think daily journalism was for me, and I didn't think that like publishing novels was for me. So I, I just kind of took a job as a fluke. I'd lived around the world, and everywhere I went, I was kind of interested in wine. So I thought, well, just take a job in, in wine, and, and immediately I was hooked. It was like this thing that, that kept, it was an interest of mine that I'd had for a number of years, and I took a casual job, and, and it just turned out to be what I was meant to do. Um, I had a number of wine jobs in Chicago, and eventually started my own company, Trading Collectibles, and through that got a job directing the fine wine department and kind of like a specialty store. And I met my husband, who was uh, visiting town showing his wine. He'd studied kinesiology, but also just fell in love with wine and decided to become a winemaker. And so eventually I found myself here. And really, I, I just think it was our pure passion that drove us to do this really irrational thing, because it's a very, very hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to fund. It's a very hard thing to start. But uh, now we have, a, like I said, a winery and two tasting rooms in town. Our wines are distributed in the UK and in Sweden. We've got dis distribution in New York, Chicago. Um, and it's still something we do for passion. It's not an easy thing to do, but I think that the hard things in business are easy if you're super passionate about what you do. And in terms of an impact that I like to make or that I think about all the time is, is really fostering that in the interns that we get, you know, planting trees really... Um, in the wine community, really supporting people who are interested in, in doing the same thing, because I think the world needs good product made by passionate people. And um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. And Michelle Geisen is with localsearchability.com. I'm Michelle, and I'm an internet marketer. I have been uh, involved in uh, many, many startups, and I've had some of my own. I started my first startup when I was 27 years old. I'm a recovered lawyer. I became a lawyer at age 27, and I soon realized after working for a stuffy law firm in Boston that it wasn't for me. Two unhappy parties fighting. So I went out, and I met a business partner on a, on a side job, and we decided to just go for it. He had a great business idea, and I had natural sales and marketing just in my genes, I guess, and I just went for it. And you know, that's the great thing about it. We didn't write a business plan, we just, we just went on a wing and a prayer, and you know what, it, it actually just took off. And in, within two years, I think we had about 60 employees, and we underwrote and processed mortgage loans for banks. We were a sweatshop. Uh, it was incredible, it was a incredible ride. We ended up selling it in year three. And then I went on to, to do other things, and work in other startups, and VP of marketing, and for small companies that were just launching products or services and um, did all kinds of things. And I just have to say that being an entrepreneur, it's, it was accidental in a way, like, like Kathy was saying, you know, it was, it was an, out of necessity, but um, it's, you know, I think it, it's in your blood and you have to explore that, that part of you. If you have an inclination to go out on your own and try something, you have to explore that, listen to it, because not everyone should be an entrepreneur, but if you have that calling, you must. Um, there, is, there is a lot of freedom, there's a lot of work, um, but it, it, you get to make it up. You get to make the rules sometimes, and uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's very creative, and it can be very stressful too, of course, but it's a beautiful path for someone's life because um, it's, it's a true expression of your, of your spirit as an entrepreneur. Thanks. Loving what you do is so important and having passion for it because who wants to wake up every day and do something that you don't like at all? 
and I, I resonated with Kathy's story um, of going into real estate so you could get through school. When I first got into broadcasting, I had my own business that I started as a teenager that I was able to do part-time and work part-time um, on-air gigs in Los Angeles, and it was only because um, I had that other income with flexibility that I was able to get into broadcasting because you don't get opportunities when you're brand new out you know, to, to get a full-time job. So um, whatever it is that you're doing, just having something you know, where you can rely on yourself and be independent and passionate about something and derive an income from it, you just never know where it, where it can go. So Kathy, uh, we have a great idea or a passion project and we think that it could be really, really big. What's the first step? What do we do first? Oh, wow. <laughs> that's a little bit. Quite, quite. Yeah, yeah that's, that's kind of like, how do you eat an elephant? Um, it, 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 it really depends. It depends upon what type of a, of a project it is. You know, if, if you have an idea for a piece of technology, you're going to have to figure out how to vet that technology first. My first couple businesses were in technology. And so the first thing we had to figure out is, can you do this? Can it be built? Um, and, and actually, that's assuming that you already have some idea that there's a market for it. And I actually think that sometimes you have to know you can build it before you really validate the market. You have to have that, that concept. You don't have to have every feature figured out, but, but you have to say, is this really possible? Like, you know, what you, you did. You had something that you knew worked. And okay, now what do we, yeah, what do we apply it to? You know, and how many different things can we can we apply it to? So, it, but you know, if you're talking about starting um, a business that's not built around technology, and um, and something that that has to be proven and manufactured and all that, I think that that the first question is understanding what the business is all about, because I do see people who think it's about one thing and they may be passionate about that and they don't understand all of the other pieces of it that they might not be passionate about. So I think it's, it's you know, sort of validating your idea, validating the why of why you're doing this. Why, you know, why is it important? Um, because those values that you select that are the most important to you are the ones that should be used to drive your business forward. Thank you. And Michelle, digital and social media is a strong component of being successful in today's business environment, and that's what your business is all about. It's also an opportunity, something that's just come along in the last 20 years or so since the World Wide Web, that offers you the opportunity to do some market research in a, in a way that you never could have before then. What could we, you could maybe talk a little bit about doing research for a, a business idea online, but also what is important to know when it comes to um, to having an online presence from, you know, being searchable and a website, social media. You can spend a lot of time on social, as I'm sure a lot of you guys know. Um, but, but where could you best put your, your efforts to use? Well, I think it depends, of course, on the nature of your product or service that you're wanting to launch, of course. But you can test test things out on the internet. You know, you could do surveys and polls and see if there's a market for it. And, and even, even using social media, Instagram or Facebook, just to, just to determine if, if there's an interest. Much like Tracy was saying that, yes, we, we, we get definitely got a high demand uh, for our product or service. And so you know the internet's such a great platform for that. And it's, it's low cost. Um, I've seen many entrepreneurs, bless their hearts, uh, throw up websites uh, a do-it-yourself approach and all of a sudden they're in business and they're getting orders and they're getting sales and then they become more savvy with time by making adjustments and um, it's just a, it's just an amazing platform to be alive at this time to have the internet uh, is fascinating because when I was younger when I first started my first business we didn't have the internet and sometimes I mentor clients I work for score I'm a mentor for score which is a SBA-funded, government-funded organization. They're all over the country. We have a chapter here where we provide free mentorship to small businesses. So I mentor a lot of different kinds of businesses. And some of my clients uh, are older or old school, don't really understand the internet or how to market their businesses in, in the new way that they have to. 
So the first thing I tell all my clients is that content is key. You really have to have excellent content and find out, number one, what people are searching for and how they're searching for it. Phraseology, it's no longer just keywords, it's phrases and it's questions. You know, how do I use a natural hair color? How, you know, where can I find a natural hair color that doesn't have chemicals? So the, the way that they're searching then, you could guide and, and direct the content on your website accordingly, sounding natural and being informative. So that's very important. And of course, there's so many aspects of internet marketing. I mean, certainly you have to have good reviews. You have to have a good website. You have to understand search engine optimization. You might want to throw some money at Google ads, which is like what the yellow pages used to be. Now you can throw $200 a month at Google ads, and all of a sudden your website comes to the top of the first page on the search inquiries. So that's an amazing tool that a lot of people are afraid of, but they really need to understand. You can set a budget and be at the top of Google in every search, along with your, your competitors, of course. So there's a whole myriad of different things that every entrepreneur has to do to, to reach out. And it's a lot of work at first, but once they get up and running and understand what they need to do on a daily basis, um, you know, internet marketing is, is just, you know, it's, it can be fun. It can be fun and creative. Right. And I mean, I want to ask Megan and Tracy about what you guys are doing with social media, but Michelle, first, do, do we, do, does an entrepreneur need to feel obligated to be on every social media platform or should you just pick the one or two that, that work specifically to your business? I think you'll have to really look at your audience, your target audience. If your audience is older, maybe Instagram isn't a good platform, but maybe Facebook is better. And we're talking social media, um, you know, so you have to really understand your audience, where they are and what they want and what they're looking for and, and show up in those spaces where they're looking for. It might be forums. It might be, you know, community websites or, you know, you just have to really understand what, where your audience is, is searching for what you have. Do you two have any specific um, social media strategy or any that work better for you? Um, I, you know, I just, I think that wine works better on Instagram. It's just where a lot of wine people are. And it really, it has, cha it has really changed over time. I think, well, I mean, Instagram w wasn't around and people were trying to, to do it through Facebook, but I think it's like, there, it's a visual. Like it's a lifestyle, labels, right? It's lifestyle, it's, it's um, you know, kind of clicks and groups. So that just turns out to be the reality for us and where we would spend our energy. Tracy? For us, uh, we would not be where we are today if it wasn't for the power of social media. Um, we launched 10 years ago, and 10 years ago, we had a young child. <laughs> um, we did not believe in social media. We did not have television in our home. We were that family. <laughs> and so when we had the idea for the business, um, and I made the website, I, imme I immediately realized, you know, SEO, I know nothing. We need this. So we went to a convention, uh, an industry convention for outdoor sports, and Brad, my husband, went around looking at what's hot in the marketplace, what is being talked about versus what we have in mind. And I took all the seminars. And I came home from the seminars and said, okay, we need, we need to be on social media. We, we just have to do this. Um, so we opened up three accounts simultaneously, and it was the absolute best decision that we ever made, and it was made for nothing. Um, we did a Riptide Sports Facebook account, so we had a business corporate profile, and then Brad had his own Facebook, I had my own Facebook. What ended up, and how we've always gone forward, is that we would make all of our posts on the Riptide Sports, and we would talk about it. We would chat about it on our personal accounts, and it made us approachable. People would reach out to us, they would messenger us, they would call us, they would talk to us, they would seek us out because we'd never sold a product online. We would chat about the product online. We would give advice online. You want to improve your setup? You're taking it for a different ride? We would chat about how that can be done. Sometimes it could be done best with our competitor's product, Sometimes it could be done best with ours. We treated them both the same. We chatted about it. We did a back and forth. Um, now with Instagram coming out um, as more popular, it wasn't 10 years ago, uh, but it is more the norm now. Yes, we're very much on that. Um, the YouTube videos, we have 52 team members that are spread out internationally. 
Um, they all post, they all tag us on our uh, YouTube channel. We have a firm rule, which made us very unpopular in the industry, that if you're not wearing safety gear, specifically a helmet, do not tag us. We are not that company. Um, it took a long time for us to be respected in the industry because of that, but now, um, now that we're, we started about seven years in, we got respect because of it, but it was a, a, a hard choice to choose. So if you're gonna go with something like that, no, thank you. But, but know that um, it's gonna be a hard, unpopular road. Uh, but God forbid, skulls don't do well when they hit asphalt at 90 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour. Um, when you mentioned, oh, so, I don't I'm want sorry. To yeah, up. one more thing, and then I'll wrap it up. But um, you know, in today's world, you've got Reddit, you've got forums for everything, you've got Facebook pages for everything. You know, these groups or whatever they are. Mm -hmm. Don't dismiss them; they are invaluable. And when you can get your customers talking about you, that third-party validation pays your bills. It will get you forward. It is absolutely what you need. It is more powerful than any print ad that is out there. If you can get a customer to leave a review, leave a video with that review, just showing his excitement. Oh my gosh, I just found Riptide, and this is, it's changed the way I, I, I feel on my board. When they can get that across, that is what will get you to the next level. So pay attention. Thank you. So when you were mentioning that you would share it on your on the Riptide page and then p talk about it on your personal pages, that's through Facebook. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. you would just like share the post from your business page and then maybe make some comments and or then you two would just make a reference to it. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, we have a lightning round. This is where each panelist gets to answer the question in, in maybe 15 seconds, a few words. Mm -hmm. Here's the first question. What's the biggest myth you discovered along the way? Boy. Do you want to start at that end to give yeah, you a Yeah, go ahead. Start okay. at that end because there okay, there's a lot of them. <laughs> the, the biggest myth for me was originally when, when people would say, oh, you have to start your own business. You'll have all this freedom. And, you know, that, that, it, that was kind of a myth because you live and breathe your business. You sleep all night long. You dream of your business. It never leaves you. So there's not exactly freedom. Uh, and it's even sometimes harder to take a day off. And when you leave at five o'clock, you don't necessarily leave the job behind you. It's always with you. So that, that was my myth. Jeez, I, I don't know. I guess we had this question in advance, but I, I uh, <laughs> you know, when I, when I first thought about starting a business, um, you know, my husband started the business that we have now. It was so intimidating to me. I thought you, you really needed so much capital and you needed so much security. And the longer that I'm in the business, I, I think that again, going back to passion, what you really need is passion. And you can start with a small amount and keep investing your passion and your time and it will work out. And, you know, uh, you shouldn't be also, uh, you know, failure was like a big concept, but the more I'm in the business, I realize you have to fail again and again. And so if you have an idea, you have something you want to do, uh, absolutely pluck up the courage and, uh, you know, pull together whatever resources you need to and just get into it. I think the, the biggest myth is that there's going to be a perfect moment or you'll have a perfect amount of security or that there is security because there's not. As an entrepreneur, you're going to fail into your success. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the biggest myth for, for us is um, that you need a significant amount of capital in order to start your own business. We're a manufacturing business. Um, we are completely self-funded. Um, oh, yeah, kudos. Um, you can do it. You have to get really creative. Yep. <laughs> um, you also have to know, you be very cognizant of your cash, what you've got in the bank. Uh, if you've got invoices due next week and you get invited out to dinner, you may not be able to pay your way. I mean, don't, don't go is, is the bottom line. Know your cash flow. Keep as much as in reserve as you can. Don't panic. It will come from somewhere. Um, but make it come. Just make it happen. OK. Um, agree with all of these. Um, it, one of the biggest myths is that it will go the way it's written in your business plan. <laughs> yeah, no, no. no, it won't. 
<laughs> okay. Trust me. There, there's that saying that no uh, plan of battle ever withstands its first encounter with the enemy. No business plan ever encounters putting it into the real world. And, and so that is part of what being resilient means, that, that you, you have to have a plan. I'm not saying you don't have a plan. You do have a plan. But then when you encounter an obstacle, you have some idea of what are my options, which way do I go? Okay, and and know that you're going to have to move that way. There's there's this thing, and actually, women suffer from this more than men. I'm finding out this is actually documented these days. Is we think we have to get it perfect. Okay, there's lots of evidence in the marketplace and studies you'll see recently that say that um, a woman won't apply for a job unless she thinks she's got 100 percent of the qualifications, and a man will apply if he thinks he's got 40. Um, it, it, we are not perfect. The world is not perfect. Nothing goes the way you think it will go. You are going to school and training yourself to have a good background to be able to make good decisions. Use it. And doesn't, isn't that what makes it more interesting along the way, right? It, it, well, it, it absolutely it makes it more interesting, and it keeps you from, from killing yourself. Because if you're going to say, oh, my gosh, it didn't go right. There must be something wrong with yeah. me. You're going to be upset every day of the week. And it, that's hardly a way to, to go through life. So know that just like when you were a kid and you didn't know the answers, you're going to solve the problem. You are. You know, and if you and if the first solution doesn't work out, spot it quickly, move on, go to the next thing. Yes, absolutely. It's been said that failure isn't the opposite of success. It's part of the success along the way, right? So, what about getting your mindset uh, um, up for taking on the world every day when you don't know, you know, how you're going to pay those invoices next right. week, or you're being so hard on yourself and, and critical? Isn't have you done anything on in self help that? that you read inspirational readings or, or what keeps you, what fitness, what, you know, exercise. Well, I, I think wine. That when I was saying <laughs> hot wine, yeah, the <laughs> wine goes a long way. No, the other, the other myth that I think I'm just discovering now is um, that you can live on your job. No matter how passionate you are about something, you know, I've, I, I know a lot of people in the wine business, they're like just wine cuckoo, they travel all around the world and they're always in other people's cellars and drinking this and drinking that. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to put your career also in perspective. You need to have a life. You need balance. I think you know it's your career serves the community. You know, what you do may serve the community, may pay your bills. It might be your life. You know, life's work in history. But um, you have you have to also always remember to be more than just about that. How have you, know, you have, done it? Have friends. Have a you know. Work out, like take some some time that's not that, and it will make you actually fresher and better in your job, because um, yeah, I think the biggest myth is that you could just live on it, no matter how passionate. You yeah, are. that is the thing about being an entrepreneur; you take it with you. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Let's talk about the funding a little bit because Tracy, you mentioned that you guys have never taken OPM, other people's money. You worked for her husband held the full time job for three and a half years while Tracy started the business and then they were successful enough that he could move into the business full time. Well, we, we, we felt we had to take the leap at that time because my husband was going to die. <laughs> too much, two businesses. You know, yeah, I mean, um, t t absolutely two businesses. He had his career, and then he was online, social media, answering questions from, you know, Singapore at one in the morning. It's like, you know, you can only do that so much. Um, we know when you go in what your stopping point is. Know how much you're willing to invest know how know what you're willing to walk away from um, we went in with our savings we had um, a feeling of confidence with what we were doing we couldn't prove it uh, for really the first few years um, but when we did then we really took the leap um, we didn't finance the equipment but we figured out a way to purchase the equipment that we needed to become the manufacturers. Um, what I'm trying to get at is know, know your market, know your dream, uh, go
go for that dream, but also know when you've gone down a wrong turn. And you either need to go down an ugly avenue to get back on the right road, or you need to stop. Um, so identify a point at which you think you might need to stop. And at that point, mark the point at which you need to walk away, if you do need to walk away. There's no shame in it. And it's all a learning experience. Um, you know, Riptide was our second company. Um, we had a first one that we tried uh, right when we were first married, and the technology was not there. Um, somebody else brought it out um, a few years ago because the technology caught up with it, and we're like, yes, they did it perfectly. It was just what we envisioned. You are just a little early. <laughs> That's it, timing, yeah, right? Yeah, it was timing. Um, we were just ahead of the game. So, you know, it, if at first you don't succeed, I mean, it is true. You have to get out there and do it. You can't be filled with fear at putting yourself out there, um, at making yourself look stupid. Uh, it happens. Um, believe me, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong at some point. It's how you deal with it. Um, personally, I am a woman in a male-dominated world. The skateboard world, oh my <laughs> lord. You know, they brought me to my knees before. And now, um, I'm Grandma Urethane. <laughs> and for a skateboard shop, I am not what they expect, and I introduce myself as Grandma Urethane. <laughs> most of the time, it's an icebreaker, because what you need to do is get them talking. And if you can get them talking, if you can open a dialogue about what you have to offer, what your idea is, what your pro product is, if you can get them talking, you've got their attention, you can open a mind that is previously closed. And at that point, you're on the right track. Thanks for that. Yeah. OK. So I come, have spent most of my life on the other side of the, the spectrum. I have raised other people's money, a lot of it. So let's hear more about that. And what it, well, like and, and I, I do want to say some, some things about it, because taking other people's money is a very dicey game, OK? Um, but you know, I started my career in medical technology, and if you're going into medical technology and FDA clearances and very large markets and things, you're going to have to raise money. It's very few of us who have enough money on our credit cards or from our friends and families to build a company like Inogen. So when I was at Inogen, we raised $53 million, all right? But the thing about, about other people's money is I'm going to say two things about this. One about how you look for other people's money. Okay, um, I um, have always said um, that the difference between whether this is an exhilarating, exhausting experience building a business and a nightmare you can't wait to wake up from mm -hmm. is the quality of the company you keep. So money isn't just money. Take it from the wrong person and it will be a nightmare, OK? Do it because you think that that's the way to wealth. It will be a nightmare. Most businesses that we are going to, to start, a lot of people like what, what Tracy did. And Tracy, you know, kudos, because she made it through, and she knew the most important thing in the world, and that's not to go beyond where you know, you're going to ruin your life and your family to do it. But but one of the things like that we're trying to solve at Women's Economic Ventures at the moment is that there's a valley of death between what you can put on your credit cards, what you can get from friends and family, and what you need in the next round of financing to get you to market. Um, and someplace, if you're below that, 250, 500,000 million dollar mark, you can't interest angel investors. And so there's, there's this um, tendency, though, if you can't get money, that somebody will say, oh, well, you need an investor. And so you will force yourself to rewrite your business plan to show that there's a possible exit that is sufficient to give an investor a return, and your business plan never should have been rewritten that way. OK? So um, when you look at how you fund it, all of the 
the things that call, call Tracy, she, all the things that they tried to keep, to, to keep the business alive. Use all of the means you can. Come to people like SCORE. Come to people like Women's Economic Ventures. Try and find a way of getting through. Don't just believe that because it needs more money, you have to have an investor. That's a great point. You want to know where, yeah, yeah, where the money's coming from, who it is, what kind of deal you're really making, because I would imagine that just you coming up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The yep. Your so do the your, your business life. Yeah, and there is no divorce, actually, because they put the money in and they will own it. That's yeah. True. yeah. So you mentioned SCORE and Weave as options to find help for your business, and a, a mentor could, could be uh, a help as well. Megan, do you want to talk about the importance of having a mentor and, and what could an entrepreneur expect from a mentor? How would the relationship work? Well, I'm not just talking about score. I'm just saying if you if you have a business idea, you, you really need a competent sounding board. You know, it's great if you can sit around with your friends and talk about it and bat it back and forth. But really, before you wade out there and you change your life, uh, completely. It's, it's good to find somebody who's doing something similar to what you're doing. I think people who have made it, people who have some success, I think are, are naturally interested in other smart, clever people with good ideas. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's absolutely something uh, that you shouldn't be shy about. Uh, you shouldn't be shy about approaching somebody who y you admire. But I would say that in terms of finding a mentor, you know, uh, have specific questions that you want to ask them, perhaps some specific angle you want to discuss with them. And I, I just think that's kind of the, one of the best things that, that you can do. Um, going back to money for a second, I want to say that, um, you know, a lot of times when we want to start businesses, we started our business and it was self-funded as well. But, and we were coming from uh, just lives as civilians and wine drinkers. And for us, money was still so loaded, like it almost had a moral overtone. You know, we're thinking about like, oh, money you spend on a vacation or this or that. Money in your business, like it's part of the plan. You have to look at it as a tool. It's a tool. Take all the other associations you have. Um, away from it and be able to, you, you have to just look at it in a very, very uh, clean way as a tool that's going to help you get from, from this part of your business to that part of your business and help you get all the things you need. Um, you shouldn't be shy about spending it. Um, you you cannot be shy about spending it. I have, um, I was mentoring a, a woman winemaker who was super duper talented and she said, well, I'm going to make a little wine for myself, but I only have this much money. I'm going to make like 50 cases. And I just said to her, don't be shy. You could borrow money from me to make more, but at the rate you're going, you're this age, uh, you'll never grow fast enough for this to be a real business. She really needed, and she was, you know, she mm -hmm. invested in a house and a car and all this, and I said, your business needs, needs more. You have to be able, but she was still looking at that, that money as kind of like a, uh, I don't know, in a regular way. You, you can't do you that. You have to be willing it? to take a leap. What? How did you get over it from feeling like it was a moral thing to just seeing it as a tool? Was just the experience or? You know what? Yeah, I, it was the experience actually of being in business with my husband. I used to say to him, you have no sense of menace. You know, it's like, <laughs> he'd be like, oh yeah, we need to spend $100,000 on this, which we didn't have when we went into the, the a credit line, which, which then I immediately you know, paid off as soon as we could. But I just saw that that's how it works. You have to take these leaps and make investments in your business, and then it, you know, it starts to, to move and grow in that way. But you can't be shy. You shouldn't be foolish, like you were saying. And you should, you should if you've got a good business plan and you're, you're willing to work it out, um, but the, you can't be shy. Uh, and, if, and if you're married, you better be on the same page. <laughs> there you go. You know, right. I mean, truly, we're, we're talking money here and that that can divide the best of partners so. and, and I think people need to also find mentors uh, to help them manage the money um, sometimes like I was 28 years old and my payroll was 200,000 a month I wow. had no experience with managing $200,000 a month with payroll at 28 years old and so I realized you know there's cash flow issues and I it, you know I mean it was intense and I finally hired an accountant you have to admit when you need help in managing money and like Megan was saying uh, there's things you're going to need to do because you're going to need more of it to keep going you're going to need you know some kind of a reserve or line of credit or something I was self-funded too at that time and I, I hired an accountant and I made the accountant I paid the accountant dearly to sit by my side for 30 days you know business a whole month show up from nine to five with me and guide me through what I needed to do to manage that kind of overhead because I wasn't prepared for the growth 
So learning to ask for help is so key. Oh, that's good. I mean, Stress I think that, that, that it, the one thing that I think everyone up here will tell you is the most important thing you need to know about your business is know your numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Financial literacy is critical because you do need to know how much capital you need. You know, I'm saying be cautious about where you get it and how you do it and, and not, you know, blow up your plan to beyond where it can go. But don't let your plan fail because there's a lack of capital. You, and that means that you really need to understand what those numbers are telling you. You need to be able to forecast forward. You need to understand where your leverage points are. And if you don't understand your numbers, you don't understand your business. Right, right, right. That's such an important lesson that you'll use to, for the rest of your life, and I know that's what you, you're learning at Antioch as well for those of Antioch students. So uh, we have time for your questions, plenty of time. Does anyone um, want have a question of our, of our panelists? Anna has the mic, so she can come I around. I have the mic. I have the mic. So anyone of you have a question? Yes, please. I, I won't give it to you. Okay, so um, my question is for all of you. Um, so. There's many different social conflicts and social, you know, problems that come, and I'm sure that there was like times that you had to deal with either a recession or um, I don't know global conflict and stuff like that, like wars and things like that, and that obviously affects the business um, and your markets as well. So my question for you is, what types of advice do you guys have for students who are um, looking to become entrepreneurs or Okay, the question is about, um, there are so much um, social conflict, um, the climate change and all these uh, social problems. So as uh, entrepreneurs, what are things that you can do to face these problems or uh, accept the challenge? I'll, I can start. Um, I, would, I would just make every aspect of my company uh, and integrate in my company, in our, our policies, in our ethics, in our mission, to an example of, of global warming and climate change, to make sure we're doing our part. We're recycling and we're, you know, we're really careful with our, leaving our footprint our, you know, in the environment as a business. And this is individually, you know, I, just, I would just build that and instill that into every employee that that's part of who we are. And I think if you develop a company from the ground up, you have this beautiful opportunity to create these values right from the get-go with that in mind. It's very important these days to keep that as part of your business plan even. Well, and, and I think that it, it, it all starts with values, and it didn't used to. I mean, years ago, um, a lot of companies didn't, like, put their values on the wall, all right? Their value was making money, shareholder return. And I think that more and more um, it is becoming clear that we can't run our lives that way. And it doesn't matter what business you're in. It doesn't matter whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're a manager for a, a company, um, whether you're in a nonprofit, whatever. It all starts with values and it starts with doing no harm. And it, so that we can all do. If we can look at every action we take and say, it, it, you know, what does this do for the, for the environment, for society, for social good, or what does it do against it? Um, sometimes, you know, you, you can't go out and have that big, that, that big impact. We have that impact in a little bit of everything we do every day. And just keep it front and center. Anyone else have another question? Yes, okay. I have a question here. Uh, it's so inspiring to hear uh, about your journey and your <laughs> successes. Uh, but if you would uh, start your business in 2020, what strategies would you have changed? Mm. That's, a That's a very good question. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I would uh, 
pay more attention to the internet right off the bat. I mean, I mentioned that we got into social media right away, but if, if we were starting in 2020 instead of 2010, um, I wouldn't have come from such an old school frame of mind um, because it, we really did. Uh, so, you know, I think that would give us a huge advantage in that we would be talking more to our demographic from their point of view, perhaps. Um, other than that, uh, right off the bat, I have to say I, I don't think we would change that much because the core of why we started and the core of how we're continuing is still there regardless of the technological uh, or climate changes that are, are here. You know, we, um, we never deviate from our core three. Quality product, innovation, there's if it's not significantly different and a reason for it to be in the market, we will not produce it. And uh, customer service. Those three are our absolute core, and it has what has allowed us to grow organically. We do not pay for ads. We have grown completely organically. That also means that it's a slower growth, but it, that also translates to as a growth that we can afford. Um, we can manage our growth. We can grow with it. Um, you know, we still get blindsided. There's no question. Um, but we've been able to roll with it. And, and back to um, part of what your initial question was as well. Um, you know, you were not only dealing with climate change and whatnot, but industry slumps, industry changes, economic downturns. And, you know, if you look at the skateboard industry, you know, it's, it's one of those cyclical industries. Did we recognize that when we got into it? No. Um, would we have liked to? Oh, Lord, yes. <laughs> you know, but it's one of those things that you learn to roll with the punches. Um, and then, you know, with something like Amazon coming along, four years ago, I had product in 425 stores over 46 countries, thanks to Amazon. And I will say, thanks to Amazon, I am down to 98. Because wow. brick and mortar has closed. Mm -hmm. And that is due to the rise of online retail organizations. Which brings up a whole other you know, question, almost an ethical question. Do you sell at the same price point to an online only store as you sell to a brick and mortar who's dealing with all those, you know, all that additional costs, costs yeah. of, of doing business. You know, it was a real issue that we had to work through and we had to create our moral compass for how we were going to go forward. And once that was created, we had to make sure that we never deviated from it. And, um, you know, to my husband's credit and mine, you know, we, we have not. Um, it caused some dissension sometimes, you know, because it's like, should we, can we, can we afford to? And it's not always the easy decision, but um, when you have your idea, dig deep, talk to everybody you can, ask them for referrals to give you other contacts so that you can do the same digging deep with them. Talk to people you don't know that are in that industry. Ask them if they'd enter it again. Ask them if they'd do it again. Ask them what they would do differently. Do your homework. It will pay off in spades. Thanks. Next question. Hi. Um, I have a question in regards to um, your company culture or, or maybe like your industry culture. Um, I've seen a, uh, or been, I've worked in a lot of toxic companies um, where I've actually worked in one where they had a great idea and they wanted to help people, but the, the structure was just awful and like it, it wasn't a healthy place to be in. Um, so I just wanted to get your tips on what you do to maintain like a positive company culture and what are like some things that you look for like that you're like I think you know like one thing that was mentioned like you know you you will not accept money from someone that you know that will cause you a lot of trouble like what other kind of tips do you have that in terms of keeping the organization in a, in a more positive way. Kathy, do you want to try that? You grew a very, very large company. Well, a few of you have. Yeah, um, we have. <laughs> I have grown um, fairly large companies. Um, and, and culture is, um, culture starts with the owners and the managers. So kind of good. And 
um, and trust and um, honesty and openness is just something that you can't get around. If it isn't there, when the first time you look at a company, if you see anything in it where you see that that the managers and owners and everything are not being honest, are not being respectful, walk away. Um, it, 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 because that's all we've got in life is um, what, you know, the, the kind of trust and commitment that, that we make to others. We, we did in all of our companies, um, we had everyone do um, psychological instruments like Myers-Briggs type indicators. Everybody would say, well, what are you doing that for? You're trying to find out what I'm good at. You're trying to find mm -hmm. out what I'm good at. I'm going, yes, I am trying to find out what you're good at, but I'm trying to find out what you're good at that he's not, that she's not, that everything. So when we all come together, we can holistically work together and balance one another out and be able to point out the things that other people don't see, okay? I want you to tell me the things that I miss, um, the things that maybe culturally I just, I don't see. Different, we, we, have, we have so many people coming together in our culture, and we should, I'm a fan of diversity and globalization and everything. I want to see more. Um, you can probably tell I'm not in favor of some of the immigration policies. But we need to come together and share with each other if we're, if we're going to save this planet. And, and so therefore, we have to respect each other's values and how um, each of the, the ways that each of us look at the world contributes to making it better. Is there another question, Anna? Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, so my question is if any of you have ever had any times of doubt, as in questioning whether something was unachievable or even times of self-doubt, and how you um, went about that. It's not easy having the nerve to get out and, you know, <laughs> do your own thing, be your own boss. Yeah. <laughs> Every day. I mean, yeah. but you have to you have to bat it away. I mean, doubt yeah. is not an option. Yeah. You have right. to wake up every day willing to take a stab at the impossible. Exactly. You know, and it's just as long as you get up and do the work every day, you'll get there. You know. Um, and and where is the doubt coming from? If you're passionate about what you're doing, if you're passionate about your idea, what is the cause of the doubt? Is it? fear of putting yourself out there to put it out there? Um, is it um, perhaps somebody saying, no, no, you, you can't do it. You, you can't do it. Um, you know, what, what is the, the origin of that? And then take, take a good, honest look at that. Yeah. But your doubt can also be telling it. you that your business plan needs a little work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's it, it, that's it, worth it. it. You know, there's an intuition, but there's yeah. an inner critic, too. So how about seeing what is working and well, noticing I, the, the positive I think thing? that's a good question, uh, Lisa, is, is that if you're saying doubt, like, um, am I sure this is going to work? Have I thought of everything? If you're asking yourself the question, I mean, you know, you never think of everything. Um, but, but, but having doubt about a specific idea, a specific thing, and saying, "Well, is this right?" You know, maybe it tells you you need to do a little more homework. Maybe it tells you you just need to jump off the cliff. Um, but, but I think that what what Tracy was saying is a good one. What's holding you back? If something's holding you back, then attack that first. You know, go go look and see what it is that it, whether it's external to yourself or internal. How are you? How are you facing it? And or even put is, it on paper. And this is yeah. where having a good advisory team is right. very or a important. You yeah. could you yeah. could have three or four uh, professionals that you meet with every quarter, or call them up if you're like, I'm having doubts about this. You know, give me a reality check. What do you think? I mean, if, if you can if you can assemble some kind of advisory team on an informal basis, it can just save you. It can really help. And personally, on a daily basis, I mean, five minutes with quieting your mind, we're so busy and distracted these days with the social media. So just relax and, and believe, too. I, I feel yeah. like you want to hold that vision. Take the time to daydream and where do you want to be and what do you want to achieve? And when, you know, when the positive kind of goes, gets, gets, gets beyond some of those doubts. 
So I think we're about ready to wrap up. Anna, do we, are we wrapping? I think we have one more question. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, from a student perspective, I am wondering about um, your experience as in uh, having a business or um, launching a product. How important would um, having an education? I'm, I'm at a path where I can transfer or I cannot transfer. How important has having an education in your experience with business been? So formal education versus learning as you go. Is that if you're looking for venture capital? Oh, Everybody's looking at yeah. me. What, what no, 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 no. I like no. I, I, I think it, I think it depends on your industry. Yeah, I think yeah. it, I think yeah. it depends yeah. on your I think industry. Ask a different panel. Um, and, and certainly, you know, <laughs> yeah. just, just starting your own business is is the education. Yeah, I mean, you are thrown in the fire from day one. You are learning all the time. It's a vocation. Um, certainly you're going to learn in business school. Certainly you're going to learn a lot of things to prepare you. I mean, Weave has an amazing entrepreneur's training program. And it's, 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 all, help, it's all really helpful. But even so, once you get into the, your, your, the startup, then it's, it's another whole level of education. You're, you're in, a, in an interesting time. You know, you're in the same time frame as, as my son. And he really uh, grappled with this question as well. Um, and, you know, today, the degree is not as important as it was back in our day. Um, the question I think I would be looking at if I were in your shoes um, is, what industry am I really yeah. interested in? What are the requirements of that industry? Are they more old school, or is it more, you know, where you can do boot camp for computer generation or something like that? Um, education these days, I feel, is to round you out as an individual. You need to learn how to think. You need to learn how to combat problems. Um, you need to learn how to think things, things through uh, sequentially when, when they get rough. Um, and also, you know, from what we spoke about at the very beginning with um, knowing the accounting forces of your business, knowing your cash flow, knowing what to expect. Um, you know, that takes a certain amount of sitting in a classroom um, and just learning about it. So, you know, there, there are parts that you really need to pay attention to, um, but the beauty of today and with today's technology, you know, would it be different today? Yes, you do have that freedom of not necessarily having to complete the degree, but, if your venture doesn't work out and you need to get a job in order to raise more money to start again, <laughs> or are just you to going have a to job. be a yeah. qualified candidate? Yeah. Yeah. You, you've got to look at it from every angle. Okay. And I, th I think that the other thing that I want to emphasize is if formal education or learning, okay? Yeah. Each and every one of us has to learn continuously these days, okay? If you're not doing that, you will not survive in the world. I'm, you know, I used to say that God has a sense of humor. I put myself through college and I swore no child of mine would ever, ever do that. And my son hated formal learning and dropped out of school. Mm -hmm. um, but he's an entrepreneur. And he is a sponge for knowledge. And so he keeps taking in all of the things. If you're willing to do that and keep yourself educated on everything it is in your business field and, and all of that, then maybe the formal education won't be that great. But it is a, a basis for allowing you to learn more easily in the future. I would say the other thing, though, is that, you know, so we're all up here talking about our passions and how we got into the businesses that we were in. But And I didn't study business, but... Um, I think that maybe we all also have like a natural self-discipline mm -hmm. and that's something that you'll find in entrepreneurs and like our minds work a certain way already. If you don't necessarily have that, that's something you can learn in school. They can give you skills and, and really uh, good ways of thinking strategically about problems. You have to kind of know yourself where you're coming from and how much that would be helpful to you. Because 
you know, you can start your business, obviously, without anyone else's permission. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be probably hard to get a job, you know, in a corporation without those credentials. And, and if you're that kind of person who could use the help in, in learning to organize the way that you think about problems, then certainly school is super important. Well, thanks so much to our panelists. You're learning by coming out tonight and showing, the, showing your interest. And we wish you a lot of success in your ventures. And thanks so much for coming out. And thanks, Annie, also for hosting us. And okay, thank you very much. Thank you.